to begin, I'd like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. This film is eligible for the Grouch People's Choice Award. You can vote for your favorite films at tiff.net slash vote. We would like to thank Felix Media for providing us with this film, and thank you to Screen Australia for their generous support. When I first saw this film in Sydney, Australia last April, I was enthralled by the spare and elegant beauty of the images and the almost mythic quality of the journey that the central character embarks upon in search of redemption and in hope for peace. I was also very compelled by the insight into a culture that up until now I had only seen as a part of news footage on the television because of the war that was happening there. And it's only been a few months after seeing it and inviting the film that I discovered the dramatic story behind the making of the film, which I think we can speak a little bit about with our guest after the film. It's so remarkable that Benjamin Gilmore has written a book about it. I'll let him tell you about that. And clearly I'm not alone in loving this film. Just a few weeks ago, Jerga was awarded the top prize for best film at Cinefest Oz, which has a little money attached, which is something very useful for a very independent film. We're really pleased to have the opportunity to speak with Benjamin Gilmore after the screening. So please join me now in welcoming him to Toronto and TIFF, Benjamin, Benjamin Gilmore. I need more coffee. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Jane. You're very wonderful. Thank you for inviting the film and thanks to Cameron and thank you for, to Toronto. Uh, and um, I just want to quickly acknowledge that, um, you know, the Afghans who are involved in making this film, uh, if only they, they were here, but they're here in spirit. They know it's screening today and that um, it's got a beautiful audience, which I'm really happy about. You know, very full house, almost full house, which is great. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the film. And I really hope you enjoy Jerga, and I look forward to your questions after the screening. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Just checking to see what sound is. Um, thank you for staying. Um, we're really delighted we have an opportunity to have uh, some time for some conversation with our guest. If you have a question, please put your hand up. I'll try to get to you, to as many people as possible. If you can keep your questions brief, um, I will then repeat them for the benefit of everyone else who's sitting at the back. So now please join me in welcoming Director Benjamin Gilmore. <laughs> and congratulating him. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm just waiting for the sound to go oh, down okay. a little it's bit. It's <laughs> okay. good, good atmosphere in the background. Yeah, it's, it's good atmosphere in the background. Nice, uh, I actually want to take this opportunity, if you don't mind, because I've not had a chance uh, to speak to you about this. I mentioned in the introduction that there's a remarkable backstory behind mm. the making of this film, in addition to the wonderful story that's on the screen. Could you give us, I know it's a bit of a saga, but if you could give us just <laughs> an outline in a nutshell the astonishing story behind the making of this film. So thank you very much for being here today and watching this film, Joga. Yes, uh, it began actually because I had a script I was working on and uh, a Pakistani businessman was very interested in putting up the money to make the story, but I would have to shoot it in the tribal areas of Pakistan up against the Afghan border. The problem was when I convinced an actor from Australia to come to Pakistan, which was already a challenge and enough convincing someone uh, <laughs> to come to a place like that. There was, for those of you who know, Pakistan's recent uh, political history. There's a lot of, you know, unrest. There has been a lot of unrest there over, over time. The last time I'd been to Pakistan in 2009, I was making a film about paramedics there and narrowly escaped a suicide bombing, a blast that happened behind my car. So. I knew there was risks there as well, but not as bad as Afghanistan. So I managed to convince this chap, Sam Smith, to come to Pakistan. When he flew in, the day after he got there, the uh, Secret Service, the Inter-Services Intelligence, uh, they d decided that the film was politically sensitive, too, too politically sensitive for them. They didn't want to make it. Uh, and apparently, they said, besides, it didn't have enough romance in it, <laughs> which is kind of bizarre to hear. but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they, they blocked the production and as a consequence our backer pulled his money out. So we were left with a, a bit of savings. I'd been working 
extra overtime shifts as a paramedic, which is my day job in Sydney, to, to raise a bit of money and some crowdfunding. And so we just had a, enough money to buy a camera in a shopping mall uh, in Islamabad. Taught myself how to use it, uh, you know. Although I had it on auto for most of the time, and um, and then and then together we decided to fly to Afghanistan and try and make the film there because I had two phone numbers of, 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 of one of an Afghan um, producer actor who was working in Jalalabad and a tour guide who'd taken me um, to various parts of Bamiyan a few years earlier, and so we flew into Kabul phoned these two chaps, invited them to breakfast and then told them the story, the rough story of what we wanted to shoot in the country. We had a, we had a script that was more of an outline really. Uh, I don't like making films in this part of the world without, you know, uh, without involvement from the, the people who live there um, all, all the way. So there was no point in writing a, a script in advance really with dialogue and so on. So uh, they decided that this was very, um, this story was very true to their their culture and their traditions, and I would reflect them in a positive light, uh, and so decided to get on board with it. And of course, once Afghans decide to help you, <laughs> there's no stopping them, and they'll protect you with their life. So that's the story of the making of, I guess. That is independent filmmaking. <laughs> I congratulate you. It's remarkable. Um, questions or thoughts, comments from anyone here? Yes, over there, please. I'm just going to repeat the question. Mm -hmm. um, she says, congratulations on the film. Mm -hmm. um, she's asking about the Afghans who are in the film. If the film were shown in Afghanistan, would those people be in any jeopardy? There's a possibility. There's a possibility. And that question, I mean, it's a very, very important question. It's certainly one that weighs on me. I had the experience with Son of a Lion, um, the first film that, that I directed in Pakistan on the border, the the lead character, the boy, Niaz, uh, it's available. Uh, it's actually available. Um, I don't know whether you have Amazon Prime here, but yes, uh, we don't in Australia. So I know it's in the States. It's on Amazon Prime now, Son of a Lion. So the boy who plays the lead character in that, um, after you know a few years, after a few years, the film started to appear on YouTube. And when I checked it about four, four years ago, it had something like 1.4 million hits and the ma majority of that was from Pakistan. And then it wasn't a surprise that a kidnapping attempt was made on the boy who was growing up. And, um, and you know, the kidnappers were, the wannabe kidnappers were fought off by, by passing friends. And Niaz actually then made a, a, a claim for asylum in Australia and we managed to process that it was rejected at first and it went right up to the high court and we we managed to just get it through so he's now living safely in melbourne so that does weigh on my mind but <laughs> it's such an important i mean i believe in film as a really important medium for change and to change people's attitudes and the way they um, feel about others and to bridge that divide and the afghans that i've worked with on this they feel the same thing and they wouldn't have got on board and taken that risk. Uh, we certainly, we were, we were paying them, but this was more than that for them. They believe in the story and they're, they, they're aware of their image in the world and it really saddens them the way the world sees them as, you know, victims in, you know, caught up in this war and that's kind of, you know, there's so much more than that. The country is so much more than that. The people are, and so, uh, you know, one thing, one of the many things I learned about Afghans was that they're fearless. They're not, you know, they they are absolutely fearless. And I was kind of brought up to believe a similar thing that you know that the tension we have in the world at the moment is between fear and love. You know, and if you entertain fear, if you, you know, invite fear, then you block love, and you. So you know, to to reach a point of love, you need to overcome those fears. To reach a point of healing, you need to overcome those fears, and that's exactly what Mike, a character, does in this film. You know, he has to uh, he has to take this journey where he doesn't have backup, he doesn't have air cover, he doesn't have his platoon around him, and his you know uh, body armor. 
and he goes completely vulnerable to the country. He has to overcome his fear in order to reach a point of love where he can have love for his life again. He learns love for the people who he was fighting against in Afghanistan. Um, so I think to get that point, you need to overcome the fear. And for the Afghans involved, it was, it was very much about that. You know, they're quite fatalistic in that sense. Um, they've got very strong faith in Allah and that, you know, their life is predestined, pre-written. And so that, you know, if they're on the noble mission, that either they're being protected or if they die, at least they've died doing something they really believe in that's important for the world. If they're as fearless as you, they're fearless. Uh, is there another? Yes, over there, please. I'll come back. Uh, the question is, she'd like to know the extent to which you may or may not have gone to make the film factual. Sure. If I could have found a soldier who had been in the army and had experienced what Mike experienced and was willing to take this journey and want to take this journey, I would have made an observational documentary. But I believe that in the absence of that, or at least I haven't found that story, there may, that story may be in the world somewhere. I would really be interested to know uh, and meet up with people who have done that, okay, taken that journey. But in the absence of that, uh, I, I felt that it was important to imagine that into being. So for me, to make a film is about imagining a better world as well, not just commenting on the state it's in, but proposing something about how it could be better to kind of move humanity forward a little bit. And so, um, you know, this idea of restorative justice within the Afghan system, you know, we think we invented restorative justice in the 90s. <laughs> Been around for 2,000 years in Afghanistan. They've got a very deep tradition of that. Uh, in their tribal codes of Pakhtunwali, as you mentioned. So, um, yeah, I, I would have, if, but the thing is with this, it is factual in the sense that um, if it had been a real, real soldier that I'd found who wanted to make this journey, that is a very probable outcome. Because we discussed this uh, scenario with the Afghans we were working with, and particularly with the elders of that village about what would happen if this soldier came and presented himself and admitted this crime? Um, how, would, how would it go? How would it play out? And this is how they said it would play out in their village. And in fact, we created a real Jirga. And some of the elders we found out afterwards actually believed Sam Smith, who plays Mike, was guilty of a crime and was coming back to apologise. So sometimes that was a bit difficult because, you know, especially with one of those old guys who was crying for his, you know, <laughs> his head. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, Amir Shah, who was our producer, said, you know, that, that old guy actually believes this to be true. But, you know, that adds to the authenticity. So. It certainly yeah. sounds a very good actor. Yes, in front here. Um, okay, I'm going to try to do that, right? Uh, for the benefit of everyone, she has two questions. The first one is, can you differentiate a little bit between um, the Taliban and the villagers? And then the second question had to do with the advice uh, or the instruction to not take the money mm. to the village. So maybe you can speak to sure. that. Thanks. So, yeah, I mean, it's the Taliban are part of the social fabric in Afghanistan. They're um, prior to them gaining control of Afghanistan in the 90s, you know, every village had its Talib and um, Taliban had, you know, were the students in the madrasa and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a fact of life in Afghanistan. You have, you have Taliban, of course, now because of the war, a lot of Taliban have been forced into the mountains and are in hideouts and so on and doing these raids on um, usually checkpoints or army, you know, checkpoints and police stations and things. 
But um, yeah, I mean, look, it's quite possible, say, the Taliban who were in the cave, that they were part of that village or a village like Ghazi Gar. Um, but, you know, there is a distinction that those elders in the village, they, they, they're farmers, they're, you know, they have, they do manual labour, they're ordinary villagers, so they're not part of that particular group. In terms of money, this is something we explored in this in, the, in this film. The idea that, you know, the, what I learned, one of the th many things I learned over in Afghanistan was their their attitudes towards money, particularly when it was handed out by the Americans. So, one of the big failures of stabilisation in Afghanistan, the failures of stabilising uh, attempts there, and it was detailed in the um, special um, Inspector General report on Afghan re reconstruction recently, a few months ago, was that. Um, you know, wherever they put the most amount of money into those insecure areas, those areas became more insecure, which is very, very interesting. And the reason for, one of the many reasons for that is because, you know, it attracts criminals, you know, it uh, empowers warlords, the wrong people end up with the money, and it causes resentment, enmities, you know, feuds, and more bloodshed. So um, on top of that, there's something offensive about the idea that money fixes things in that culture. You know, Afghans are not only very smart, but they're very, you've got a lot of pride and dignity as a people. And there's us thinking, okay, so we kill the civilian as part of this, you know, raid, and now you want to pay us off as if you're, as that Taliban guy said, you know, you want to buy, buy the life. And that's the impression we got that I think the American condolence payment for a, a civilian death is around two and a half thousand dollars. So Afghans know that. They think that we believe that their lives are worth two and a half thousand dollars. And so, you know, it's all the meaning attached to that. So it was really important that our character made that choice to ditch the money and to understand that it, he couldn't buy his forgiveness, he couldn't buy his freedom. And in a sense, I'd, I'd love us, you know, the, the things I learned along the way of, of building this story with Afghans was kind of uh, taught me a bit about where I think the international community has gone wrong in the country, mm -hmm. thinking that, you know, we can solve the problem through more troops and more money, you know, and they've spent, what, $2 trillion in the country mm -hmm. and Taliban have got 60% control of the territory after 17 years. It's like, what, how does that work? You know, something's gone wrong in the approach. Anyway, I can rattle on about that. Yeah, no, no, it's it's a much larger question from around <laughs> sure. the world. All yep. around the world, you're exactly right. Mm. And yet that was one of my most favourite moments of the film when he made that decision to leave that money because mm. you it elevated the whole idea of well, what he what the stakes were. If you if you you know, to create peace you need authentic engagement, you know, you can't have a yeah. prop of something material, you know, it needs to be you know, you look me in the eye and you you tell me that you're sorry and let's move forward. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, he was already courageous enough to make, to have, he had moral courage enough to, to make that journey, mm -hmm. but he still had that Western thinking, of, you know, I'm going to be able to make up for this with money. Net. It was his safety yeah. net. Yeah. So, um, yeah, originally we actually had written it so that the Taliban saved him in a sense by secretly taking his money. And when he was searched on the outskirts of the village, he realised that his money was gone and his safety net was pulled but I think it's important in, in, in a film for your protagonist to have some kind of, uh, yes. you know, um, I guess uh, agency over their, their future or their fate, so Agreed. to speak. So he needed to he needed make to a decision. Make the decision. Yeah. yeah. Mm. We have time for one more question. Go ahead, sir. Uh, can you tell us about the actual geographic locations where you shot and what um, uh, tribal... What ethnic, ethnic Yes, groups. ethnicities were there. Sure. So we shot in Jalalabad and on the outskirts of Jalalabad in Nangarhar province. It's right close to the uh, Pakistan border. It was a very risky part of the country to shoot in. So Afghanistan's got a lot of diversity and it's uh, in many different ways, but also in security status. Bamiyan, where we shot, was so safe that I was leaving my, uh, the fortress where we were staying in the morning and taking a walk into town and back on my own. And that was in Bamiyan, no problems there. That was a Hazara area in the centre of Afghanistan where the lake 
near, near the lakes. But those the mountain locations and the final scenes, they were all shot in um, Jalalabad, and that was that was very more difficult. They're, they're patched on areas, but of course, in in some of those areas, you have in Jalalabad we had. Um, Daesh, ISIS in the mountains that were only a few valleys from where we were shooting. You had Taliban positions that were very close by. Um, some some of our actors suggested that Taliban were actually protecting us against ISIS, which was kind of bizarre. Some of the Afghan army guys we were with had you know Taliban on speed dial to back them up if they ever needed back up against ISIS. So it's very interesting dynamic going on there. It's quite possible that in the next year or two you'll find Taliban and ANA fighting together against ISIS. So our former enemy actually, in a weird way, becoming our allies <laughs> against a, a worse enemy. So yeah, fascinating. But yeah, I mean, I've always been very, very drawn to the Pashtun areas. I really have a, have a love for that culture and their tr traditions and their ancient tribal codes. And they're just the warrior poets, you know, I love that. Of course, you know, of course I romanticize that a bit, but um, they romanticize it too, you know. They, they love sitting around, passing roses around and drinking tea and reciting poetry, you know, with their AK-47s, you know. <laughs> it's bizarre, but it's kind of like, it's a, it's a type of masculinity that, um, you know, we've got this macho thing going on in Australia where if you don't play rugby and if, you know, and you get drunk at the pub, you know, if you do poetry and stuff like that and you're homosexual or something, you know. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, in Afghan culture, you can do that as a heterosexual fellow. You can actually, you know, be poetic and be creative and, you know, you know, have a rose and pass it to your mate and go check it out. It's not a good one, isn't it? You know? So I love that. Uh, you want more questions? Another. I'm um, also oh, happy oh, to right. talk. Just, yeah. Okay, quick. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, I've got dual oh, questions sorry, happening. I'm pointing to the lady behind you. <laughs> we can talk. Of the sheep? Okay. In that, in that culture, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, a, a b biblical thing too. And the people of the book have that story of Abraham and the sacrifice. And so in, in Pashtun culture and Pakhtun Wali, if the decision of the Jirga is that someone who is guilty of a crime of murder is forgiven, that there needs to be a blood sacrifice made. Um, so they were, they were going to sacrifice that sheep anyway because it was the gift to the village for being involved in the film. And we caught that on camera and it worked very well in that sense. And I'm sorry for the vegetarians in the room. Sometimes, sometimes it can be hard to, to watch that, but we felt that it was really... You close your eyes? Uh, yeah. I respect that. No. Yeah. <laughs> my wife's vegetarian, so she, she does too. But um, I'm happy to talk to any of you afterwards. And also you can email me with questions or feedback or comment. I'm happy to engage. I really love to get response and feedback from you. So... Here's my feedback. This is one of the most remarkable films of the year. You are one of the most <laughs> remarkable filmmakers in this festival. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much for being with us today. Congratulations on a wonderful film. Thank you, everybody.